Welcome to everybody. We'll just give everybody a few seconds to, to log in and we'll start in just under a minute. <coughs> Can I just remind everyone if they're not speaking to silence their microphones? Thank you. Okay, well, welcome to all the participants and the panel uh, to this wonderful webinar, which is regarding advancing the classification of hydrocephalus. Um, and uh, in addition, time for a new aspect. We welcome all the participants from around the world and all those watching on YouTube and elsewhere. Um, and uh, it's great to, uh, to be together. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, you're welcome to, to participate uh, as the webinar goes on by putting your questions in the Q&A section um, as we go along and we can answer and, and, and get you involved as best as we can. Um, the figure behind me is a, a, a place I wanted to visit uh, this year, um, uh, starting last year, and I'm sorry that I've not been able to. It's, uh, I'm told it's the most visited site on the planet. But with the current crisis, uh, which we are all involved in, uh, we miss being with each other. And we've not been able to meet as a group uh, at all, although we managed to meet several times online. And it's amazing what has been achieved with this, uh, with this wonderful group. And I, I, I thank you all. The project has been under the umbrella of the EANS. Um, and uh, we are very grateful to all the panel members. A little bit about the history of how this came to being. The EANS was approached um, some years ago about having a CSF section, um, which um, uh, was um, a, a useful thought and it was entertained, but it was formally proposed in Brussels uh, with um, myself as one of the IM delegates in 2018 and supported by uh, Ricky Reichardt, who, who kindly seconded that. And that went on to become formally discussed in Dublin 2019 and approved in November 2019 as a task force. And one of the projects, one of the projects of the CSF task force uh, has been the development of a classification of hydrocephalus, which is a, a long term project and one that is very much in need. Um, and personally, myself, with influence from great teachers of the past, such as Paul Steinbach and, and um, Doug Cochrane and Ashtingal in Canada and countless others now in the United Kingdom, we, we really do feel the need for this uh, development uh, to improve the treatment of patients, both children and adults with hydrocephalus. The purpose of a system and eventually classification is quite special. The system is not intended to score or measure the magnitude of hydrocephalus. Um, it was really to facilitate initially communication, record keeping, in order to save lives and optimum outcome, uh, to provide the optimum outcome and improve the quality of life of our patients. But essentially what is a benign condition and, and uh, should have a good outcome if we get the treatment right. Also to facilitate education and training and eventually when the classification is perfected, hopefully with efforts from everybody who wishes to contribute to this endeavor from around the world, then we can implement that eventually for research as well. The group, I'm delighted to say, is a magnificent one, and we are honoured in the task force that the group have taken on this, this role. And I'd like to introduce Professor Ahmed Amar, Andre Grotenhaus, Marianne Juller, and Harold Roquet. And although they need no introduction, I, I feel I'm impelled to say something about this magnificent group. Um, Ahmed very kindly uh, has agreed to chair and take on this project, and Ahmed needs no introduction, born in, although I will say a few words. He was born in Egypt and has been giving his services to neurosurgery in Saudi Arabia for decades. He's set up the first fellowship program in, in pediatric neurosurgery, the first fellowship program in Saudi Arabia, the first training board in Saudi Arabia, and has done immense services. I've got several patents and innovations to his name and is the author of several textbooks, including the one on hydrocephalus. Um, and so I couldn't think of anyone better to, to lead on this. And I really value his uh, ethical approach as well. Andre, again, needs no introduction. And I will say about Andre that he's an absolute inspiration. And um, his services to neurosurgery, pediatric neurosurgery, the past really four decades have been immense. 
uh, on the EANS, on the international scene. And I will just finish off by saying for Andre that um, he, for me, it's Im amazing that he's been given as a neurosurgeon, the, the highest award uh, a civilian can receive uh, um, in Netherlands by being an knighted in the order of the Netherlands lion. And this is absolutely amazing. Marianne, again, needs no introduction. She's an amazing lady and she's been a prestigious and wonderful teacher in the EANS, being given the all-time uh, uh, training award or train of the decade rather. She's got a, a superb reputation and present in every CSF and hydrocephalus uh, international group and has been a great inspiration with her knowledge and research. And she and her group from Copenhagen have brought with them the skeleton and the basis on which uh, this new classification could be built on. And we are very grateful to that. And we're grateful to the team there. And finally, Harold. Uh, Harold needs no introduction, but I will say that for me and for many, many others, he is the godfather of pediatric neurosurgery. Uh, and uh, he led the, uh, the Department of Pediatric Neurosurgery, one of the most prestigious units in the world uh, for over a quarter of a century, has authored hundreds of articles and been the editor of countless journals. And uh, I'm humbled to be um, in the same group uh, and involved uh, that Hal is present. In. And I thank him and all the panel. Moving on, there is support from, uh, from a younger generation. I welcome Joachim. And Andrea, Andrea is one of our excellent trainees who's uh, been sampling and testing and trying this new system. And we're very grateful. Joachim has worked on this right from day one with Marianne and we are very grateful to him. And of course, Casper Riddle, who's sadly can't join us because he's saving lives on the wards at the moment, I understand, um, but his work has been wonderful as well. And to all the EANS CSF members who are welcome to contribute to this. And I cannot stress that enough, which we will talk about more because this is a team effort. This is not uh, a, a one person or a, or a small group. So you're welcome to take part in the CSF task force meeting on the 23rd of February and join us. And furthermore, on specific meetings on this very subject. We will also meet in Hamburg, hopefully in person between the 3rd and 7th of October. And we hope to have a whole meeting for our own group on the 2nd of October, uh, which would be the, the day before the inauguration of the meeting. Um, finally, for me, the greatest fruit of this endeavor has been the uh, approach taken by the group and, and Ahmad uh, as the lead on this. Um, it's been really on, on a values-based medicine, um, which is a term, in fact, Ahmad has introduced into the literature uh, in, in the chapter uh, in the book on neuroethics and principle and praxis, um, conceptual foundations, and this is wonderful. Um, so for me, it seems to be that the ethics seems to be detached from prejudice. And what I mean by prejudice, to be frank, is prejudice of language, whether it's one group or a nation doing this. We are open to all. Uh, it's not bound by country or departments, and you will see how welcoming we are. Um, it's based on evidence, based on truthfulness, based on a mindful analysis and values-based medicine. And I would urge all to uh, enjoy the endeavors of this group, which is going to be ongoing uh, and to act in unity. Um, and I will quote Baha'u'llah who said, no power can exist except through unity. No welfare and no well-being can be attained except through consultation. Um, I will hand over to Ahmad and thank you once again for, uh, for participating. Thank you, Mansoor, very much for the introduction. And actually we cannot thank you enough for initiating this group and other CSF uh, uh, task force groups. You know, your work is really brilliant and we all grateful to you. Now I would like to go for just introduction to introduce our group and what we aim and what we are, what, what, what's our plan and uh, who is it. So I, uh, I would like uh, where is <laughs> I want to share the screen.
Okay. 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 I have one. So this is our hydrocephalus classification group. And as all of you know, why EANS, you know, considered hydrocephalus is one of the projects because this is a scope of the work of hydrocephalus is tremendous. It goes all the way from fetal to senior. We will not discuss it now, but we'll see it later on. But how important is the subject? I'm sure that all of you watching us know. This is from the Global Surgery Journal uh, two years ago, showing that is, we have 400,000 new cases of infant hydrocephalus every year. There are nearly 1 million operations are needed for such children every year. This is rather than it is, we consider it as a simple problem, but it is a serious problem. It has a mortality, which varies between 5%, 30%. But when we talk about complicated or complex hydrocephalus, we, the rate of mortality is very high. Even in the best service in the United States or in Japan or in Europe, that is, there is no zero mortality. Is the mortality around 1%. So how is this serious? So now come to the question, do we need a new classification? And there are already several classification. The answer is yes. We need a classification for pattern management and for to help a decision making for hydrocephalic patient to present and the scientific advancement as the science improvement and develops, the knowledge increases. And so that is our hypothesis needs that we change it. To provide also the very, very important common language and the precise way of communication between the neurosurgeons uh, uh, when they refer a patient from one place to another. And it is important also to provide a platform for research and education. It is also providing a chance for patients and patient families and the community for education and better understanding of hydrocephalus and hydrocephalic patients. Our group, our group was formed in October 2020. I, I have a great honor and pleasure to be a, to be a member of this group and to be among a great people and great friends I can say lifelong friends and very, very, very humble, uh, outstanding people. Uh, Mansoor, as you see, Harold, Andrea, and Marianne at the heart group. What is special with this group? It's not only the old people like me in this group, but the young people. We are working hand in hand with a group of brilliant young promising neurosurgeon, Andrea from UK and the Copenhagen team, Joachim, Kasper, Sarah, and others. And this is a very important thing that's working together in harmony and uh, in friendship and in very good healthy environment. That's why within four months, we were able to come up with such a classification aspects which you are going to see later. That is, I believe that is the harmony, friendship, trust between the group helped us a lot to perform what we did till now. We had, we were told you have one task to introduce a system which will be provide a global practical and scientific classification of hydrocephalus. So we set our vision and the mission our vision was improving the outcome of hydrocephalic patient is a demanding and visible goal. We should work for it. We can achieve it. And our mission, formation of a research group to study the proposed new classification of hydrocephalus and its implementation and audit it. And we can receive feedback and we can change by time. We also promote hydrocephalus and CSF research. The objectives are very clear in our mind to produce a system. We are not producing a, you know, a scoring uh, uh, 
system. We are producing a system that will formulate a classification of hydrocephalus. That is scientific, practical, simple, and globally utilized. And this is to provide a scientific, clinical, and reliable follow-up and recording system for each patient and to be implemented in the daily practice. Also, we, it is in clear in our mind, we would like to create one language to facilitate communication between neurosurgeon in different places when they refer patients from one place to another, and also facilitate communication and understanding between the neurosurgeon and the other healthcare authorities. Research and the public educations are very important uh, objective which we should work to, for it. So we are going to hold several webinar, workshop, and publication in that subject. Family and the community medication, it is part of our objective which we, our work should extend it to them. So the plan is to publish and announce aspect system as a tool to evaluate, uh, record, and document the hydrocephalic status upon seen in the clinical in the clinics or ER. And that is today we achieved this announcement. Then hold several webinars, seminars, workshop to explain the new system and receive feedback from everyone. And then audit and see what is going, what's good about it and what needs uh, improvement. All of you know, there are tens of publication about classification, different types of classification, starting from Dandy when you talked about obstructive and um, uh, communicating hydrocephalus, and Russell's after that in the 50s was emphasized the same principle. And we have Tony Raimondi, we have Shuzi Oi, we have uh, Diroko, we have uh, a lot of people. And of course, uh, the most famous one, Harold Rike, Rike about his classification, which was published in 2008. We have tens of books about hydrocephalus as well in the medical library. And most of them, they are also talk, uh, talking about different classification. We have a leaders, mentors, teacher, which who taught us about this, starting Adam, Hakim, Fisher, and um, uh, Dandy, of course, is the beginning, Tony Rimaldi, Harold Hoffman, Fred Bernstein, Yaris uh, Fre Fl Fleming, Harold Rike, Shox, Diroko, uh, David McClone, and uh, John Walker, uh, uh, Jim um, uh, Drake, uh, Jim Rodka, Ad, uh, Dave uh, Addison, and uh, Marianne, and uh, our dear friend who passed away a few months ago, Memniski, is the leader in genetics, and of course, and many, many others. So hydrocephalus classification group, I will leave, I will not go long. And as the message which we would like to say, and to end my presentation with, the contribution of our mentors, the teacher, colleagues, and every neuroscientist and neurosurgeon in the field of hydrocephalus and CSF dynamic are recognized, appreciated, respected, utilized, and built on to produce such a system aspect. Aspect is an advancement system based on previous experience and utilized updated knowledge. Hydrocephalus classification group is an open group and welcome new members, welcome new societies, welcome new groups. We welcome ideas and contribution. It is a work for all of us together. It's not a work for what me and not you. All of us should work together for one aim, to get better outcome for the patients benefits the patient, benefits the societies, and benefit the science. So now this is my talk uh, finished, and we will go, I wish you all to enjoy the rest of the beginning of the webinar. We cannot start our first webinar with someone better than Harold Rike. He is as uh, all of us learned from him. And uh, as uh, Mansur said, we consider him as the godfather of pediatric neurosurgery. He is going to talk today about Shant from the Hell. So please, Harold. Hello, everybody. Um, it's 
it's my great pleasure to have an opportunity to give a, a talk uh, today um, on something that I've been doing for a long time. Let's see if it works. So, so it's like, so play from start. All right. So again, thank you um, for all your work, Mansoor. Thank you, Ahmed, for the nice introduction. And thanks to the ENS for putting this on. Uh, it is likely that shunts have saved more lives and more IQ points than any other neurosurgical procedure ever. They are not without their problems, however, and we'll be talking about that. And in putting the idea of a classification on, uh, on the table. Uh, the thought processes discussed here have been developed over 40 years of clinical care and research. And I wanna thank all the engineers that have worked with me as mentors to, for me to understand the biophysics and biomechanics of, of hydrocephalus. So for, for the most part, hydrocephalus follows the laws of Newtonian physics. At maturation, the brain is a semi-spherical vessel that can be stretched or compressed. Hydrocephalus is an active process leading to distension of the ventricles. Except in the case of uh, overproduction from, uh, of CSF from choroid plexus tumors and uh, things like that, uh, it, there's an obstructive causation in all cases of hydrocephalus. In order for the ventricles to distend, there must be a higher pressure in the ventricles than there is in the exterior of the brain. We will therefore be dealing with transmantle pressure gradient or differences. There has to be a pressure difference in order for the ventricles to expand. It's just a matter of, of Newtonian physics. As hydrocephalus develops, or as the size of the ventricles decreases following shunt repair, there is actually no change in the volume of the brain itself. That's a very important thing. If you, you fix a shunt and you have a CT scan in the operating room, uh, the ventricles will, can, may well be already down to their uh, baseline um, just by fixing the, the shunt. Hydrocephalus has many forms and it is critical that the care team, the patient, and for children, the parents understand how the hydrocephalus affects the individual. I think that's the, one of the goals of the classification. I will be, be dealing with two of these issues that are critical to our understanding of the understanding and management of an individual. The first of these relates to whether the biomechanics of the in, individual patient complies with the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis. Is the intracranial compartment of a fixed volume? It makes a huge difference in the outcome and the management. This cartoon shows what's happening in a patient whose hydrocephalus develops after the skull is essentially no, no longer as distensible. In all these cases, there is a restriction of flow from the ventricles to the point of the final absorption of CSF into the systemic circulation. The mechanics of CSF absorption are controversial and are a subject of great research now. But, um, but we see that for most patients, the CSF absorption occurs in the distal cort cortical subarachnoid space near the, the venous sinuses. The increase in the volume of the ventricles lead to a redistribution of CSF from the cortical subarachnoid space to the ventricle or vice versa. With shunting, the decrease in the size of the ventricles also leads to an increase in the cortical subarachnoid space as seen in these pictures. So this is, there is no change in the volume of the, of the uh, brain in these pictures. It is only a redistribution of the spinal fluid from one source to another. Now that isn't true in when the child has a distensible head. In the fetus and in early postnatal life, the biomechanics are a bit different. When the baby is subject to the same causes as the older patients, the mechanics can be significantly different. The skull is distensible and the fontanelles are open. If the problem relates to a terminal absorption of CSF, the first thing to happen is that the cortical subarachnoid space distends, leading to an enlarged head. If the condition is more serious and the pressures in the, in these, uh, in the dural venous sinuses are greater, 
this leads to, leads to a decrease in, uh, an increase in the uh, entire head and the ventricles as well. Uh, both the CAC, CAC, cortical subarachnoid space and the ventricles dilate in hydrocephalus. In this situation, the transmetal pressure difference, the, the reason that the ventricles can expand is that there's a difference between the inside of the ventricle in the ventricles and on the outside. In this case, it's not the cortical subarachnoid space, but it's atmospheric pressure. Um, the usual and maybe the only uh, cause of this condition relates to significant increases in the pressure in the dural venous sinuses. There can be no failure of flow from the ventricles to the cortical subarachnoid space. When the shunt fails at any point later in, the, the, uh, in life, ICP will increase, but there will be no increase in the size of the ventricle. This has been called normal volume uh, hydrocephalus or the severe slip ventricle syndrome. And this problem uh, represents a high percentage of the shunts from hell or the shunt that is very difficult to keep working. The other thing that we're talking, I'm talking about today uh, is the second point is the point of obstruction of flow to CSF. And the, it, the important thing is the imaging at the time of shunt failure. The initial uh, scan may not show where I, actually the uh, point of obstruction is. But in, in, when the patient's ventricles enlarge, that means that there's a failure of flow between the ventricles and the cortical subarachnoid space. It has to be by Newtonian physics. In triventricular hydrocephalus, uh, the aqueduct of Sylvius is blocked. These patients are candidates for endoscopic third ventriculostomy with a high level of, of, of chance that the shunt will not be needed afterwards. The same is true of quadraventricular uh, hydrocephalus in which the outlets of the fourth ventricle are blocked. The next step would be all ventricles are involved. Uh, this has been called communicating hydrocephalus by Dandy, but that meant that the there was un, 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 the, this flow from the ventricle to the spinal subarachnoid space is not a, not a problem. It doesn't mean that it's it's not it's getting to where it has to be to be absorbed. Uh, Ranzelhoff in 1960 uh, in his paper on hydrocephalus um, suggested that it be called extraventricular obstructive hydrocephalus. In these cases, if the if the ventricles have expanded, that it can't there can't be an unrestricted flow to the cortical subarachnoid space. There has to be a blockage between the spinal subarachnoid space and the cortical subarachnoid space. In all of these cases, the patient it will be amenable to endoscopic third ventriculostomy. And in a significant percentage, the patient would not need the shunt re re replaced at, um, or fixed. However, there is a situation in which the shunt uh, fails and the ventricles do not become enlarged. This is always a terminal absorption failure and usually is due, usually or always is due to venous hypertension. So what does a third ventriculostomy do? A third ventriculostomy creates an opening between the third ventricle and the interpenocular cistern that bypasses the need of the flow from the third ventricle to the fourth to the fourth to the spinal subarachnoid space and from the subarachnoid space, uh, spinal subarachnoid space to the cortical subarachnoid space. So the CSF can get to the areas where the, the CSF is absorbed. Um, and that's the reason that we are con concentrating on the fact that there has to be a pressure differential between the ventricle and the cortical subarachnoid space for the ventricles to expand. Or from one CSF compartment to another, there can be a, uh, if there's a difference in the pressures in the two, there will be a change in the volume of, of the dis distri distributes between them. This is the protocol that we've used um, for management of shunts from hell who have had multiple ER visions, vis visits, lost days of school or work and incapacitating headaches. It allows for safe understanding of the options for management. In our series, approximately 10% of pediatric or transitional hydrocephalus were found to have non-responsive ventricles. While there is not a great, great deal of literature on this subject, 10% is the expected number. 
In the study by McNatt and McComb from Children's Hospital in Los Angeles, that the percentage was 9% of first, uh, and the first shunt was, um, get was, was pertum done it, at a, a mean of 11 months of age and a median of 0 0.8 months in the first few weeks of life. This condition is for the most part and maybe completely a problem of babies shunted in infancy. The also that the, in all, of all comers, uh, ETV and patients whose ventricles have enlarged will be able to be shunt independent uh, in about a third, about two thirds of the patients. And if spina bifida is uh, not part of the issue, which is a more difficult thing, it's probably as high as 80% of patients can go home without their shunt. And this is a safe way of doing it. We keep them in the ICU for three or four days afterwards with external drainage before we let them, we remove the, the drain. Now we'll start on um, the shunt, uh, a single case of a shunt from hell. Um, this relates to a patient that is now 23 and I saw her first at age 18 months. These scans are her initial scan at six months of age when she presented with a rapidly growing head, bulging fontanelle and was severely irritable. She was seen elsewhere uh, and, sorry, and um, a shunt was placed and she underwent six revisions in the following year, all due to proximal obstruction. When I saw her, I placed a ventricular catheter in the cortical subarachnoid space and placed, placed it to the ventricular catheter proximal to the valve. So that allowed a, um, this, the cortical subarachnoid space and the ventricle to have the same pressure proximal to the valve. It's important that, it, that both communicate prior to the valve mechanism in order to prevent a, a, the creation of a transmantle pressure difference. But as you can see, she has a great deal of cortical, uh, of the uh, of CSF in the cortical subarachnoid space in her initial studies, as well as hydrocephalus. At the age of uh, nine, she presented with mild syndrome, syndromes and a CT scan was done that showed the ventricles were dramatically enlarged. I had no idea what that meant. I injected a little dye into the, um, into the shunt reservoir and it went into the ventricle, but didn't go into the, uh, into the peritoneum and didn't go into the cortical subarachnoid space. What had happened is there had been a kinking of the tubing so that uh, the, the shunt was draining the cortical subarachnoid space and not draining the ventricles. This is the only time that her ventricles have been enlarged since the, she was two years of age. So there was a, a pressure differential like in hydrocephalus with a blockage between the ventricles and the cortical subarachnoid space. And there was selective drainage of the cortical subarachnoid space leading to the ventriculomegaly. Um, if I had, this, this was now 15 years ago. And if I had the same case now, I would have gone in and taken, a, done a third ventriculostomy in order to, to make the CSF flow to the cortical subarachnoid space but I was unaware of the importance of the transmantle pressure gradient at that time. So uh, at the age of 19, she um, had a shunt uh, failure. Um, she um, underwent a shunt revision. And um, at the time when uh, she developed a, a, an infection, the infection was managed with an external drain and antibiotics and the shunt was replaced. The difference was that they, present, they did only a ventricular peritoneal shunt, not, not involving the cortical subarachnoid space. She presented with severe papilledema, uh, severe loss of vision, some loss of hearing, and, and, and intense headaches. ICP monitoring um, showed without any in, increase in her ventricular size, she had an ICP of 75 millimeters of mercury. She went, a, went uh, and in and uh, put a catheter in the cortical subarachnoid space and created a um, flowing system between the ventricle and the cortical subarachnoid space. And she's now three years out from that and is working and doing well and hoping to be a mom. 
Um, the normal uh, treatment of normal volume hydrocephalus would be ideally to do a lumboperitoneal shunt, which um, drains both the cortical subarachnoid space and the ventricle at the same, same pressure. It is whenever you have a, con a difficult case and, uh, the, and the ventricles don't, don't expand, the, third, uh, the lumboperitoneal shunt is best. The problem is that in neither achondroplasia nor the Chiari II malformation, is this a rational thing to do uh, because of the difficulty of draining the, the lumbar theca? So in that situation, I recommend doing a, a cisterna magna to ventricle to peritoneal shunt. It's a complicated thing, but it works beautifully and is a long-term, we, we, we at this time in the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics, we published our first 10 cases. Um, this was, uh, is, is a very effective way of dealing with the shunt from hell. So the key to management of the shunt from hell, determine the type of physics uh, at the individual at the time of shunt failure. This is really important. You need to know when the shunt was originally, was the, when the treatment really began, when the hydrocephalus really began, and you really need to know where the point of obstruction is. And then you can tell that with high degree of certainty on, on a regular uh, CT scan or MRI scan. It is essential that all CSF compartments, com uh, uh, in, including the ventricles, the cortical subarachnoid space, the cysts or anything else that's where there's a significant uh, amount of CSF, that they all see the same pressure. Only one valve for all components. Um, endoscopic fenestration of isolated compartments should be the first decision. So even if you have to put a shunt back, it can handle all of the CSF, not just a small part of it. Um, in the situation of um, the normal volume hydrocephalus where they have high intracranial pressure um, without, a ventricular, without ventricular dilatation, I recommend that they get a document, documented and maybe a medic alert bracelet so that when they, have, when they move to a different le uh, le level, level of care uh, to, um, to adult care, for, for instance, that um, they um, have documentation that this is a problem because it's not well recognized. I would like to be able to, for everybody to go out and teach everybody else that this can happen. It probably can only happen if the shunt, if your first original shunt was placed in the first year of life. It's not known by all pediatric neurosurgeons, and it's, it's not even thought about in, uh, when it, a, an adult, a, a neurosurgeon who's dealing with specifically with adults will see the transition patients. I really appreciate the opportunity of giving this talk and for your uh, listening to me today. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much, Hals. Great talk as usual. Many lessons to learn. And uh, of course, we may have uh, time for discussion at the end. Now we come to aspect. So towards classification, advanced classification of hydrocephalus. Uh, it's a pleasure to present Marianne Yohlari. She's, you know, as I'm not going to add much for, uh, uh, for what uh, Mansoor said. I know her for nearly uh, 30 years. I am very proud and honored to have, to know Marianne as a great, outstanding lady, outstanding scientist, and very, very good friend. And uh, she really, is, I, I would like to acknowledge again, the main skeleton and the framework of aspect is done by Copenhagen team. Marianne, Jacob, Kaspar, and the rest of the group. They offered us without any demands, without any restriction, all their experience. And that's why everything was built so easy in very short time. We are really grateful to all of you. So now we listen to the master. Marianne, go ahead. Thank you, Ahmed, um, for the introduction. I'm really touched to the heart. Uh, and I am so happy that you um, 
that you acknowledge uh, the young people who have been working uh, so hard and in such a dedicated way. It is not fair that all the old ones just run away with the honor. Uh, I think the, um, the recognition of their work is, is, is truly due. Um, so let me see if I can share the screen. Uh, there we go, I think. Uh, let's see if that's the right one. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. So um, um, it's been said in the introduction uh, uh, why uh, classification of hydrocephalus is needed. It's been uh, mentioned how uh, hard people have worked on achieving a class of useful classification over the, the ages. So I think the question of whether it isn't only for the nerds uh, is actually pretty obvious. It is not only for the nerds. The problem is that some of the previous classifications uh, have, been, uh, have been difficult to understand or difficult to apply, and that has maybe given it a slightly nerdy reputation, although it is uh, very practical. So this is why it is necessary to consider. And that is why it does have a relevant and useful uh, perspective in a wider sense. And that's why we should look at it. But before we can answer the questions above, uh, uh, it's necessary to look at some of the ways that have been used and proposed to classify or systematically describe uh, hydrocephalus. We need to look at the present ICD-10 or ICD-11 system. The ICD-10 system is the one currently in use for uh, coding uh, uh, disease, uh, 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 disease uh, diagnostic, uh, disease codes worldwide. Uh, and it of course also contains a system for classification of hydrocephalus. The one in use presently is the ICD-10 and uh, there will be a revision of it in about a year. Uh, the ICD-11. The reason why we need to look at this is because it's so widely used, almost uh, ubiquitous, uh, but as we shall see, it is uh, clinically quite unhelpful. Uh, unfortunately, it's not much better for research purposes. Um, uh, we shall look also at um, uh, some of the other published hydrocephalus descriptions or classification systems. Uh, and we can see that there are some general limitations in some of these systems. Uh, and this will lead up to the introduction of, the, of a new system that we have all been working on, uh, the so-called uh, core aspect system. Uh, so we'll go on to the next slide, looking at the ICD-10, as I said before, it's widely used, but it, uh, when we go through it, uh, we can see how it illustrates some of the major issues in uh, in a systematic classification of hydrocephalus. Uh, this is the way the system uh, looks. Uh, we're not going to go into it in detail, but just uh, uh, zoom up for some things. Uh, on the uh, right-hand side of the, uh, of the bar through the middle is uh, the infantile and congenital uh, variants of hydrocephalus. And on the left-hand side are uh, uh, all the others, so to speak. Uh, so on the right-hand side, we have the congenital infantile and on the left, actually no age is specified. So let's, for simplicity, just look at the uh, lanes that uh, have no age specification. So it's used for adult and various types of pediatric hydrocephalus. In the system, using both sides of it, it's not intuitively logical to apply a pediatric or infantile diagnosis to an adult patient. Although kids do grow up with an infantile or pediatric type of hydrocephalus uh, and still uh, uh, require uh, that recognized in, in the coding on, or in the definition of their, of their hydrocephalus. Uh, and the system uh, does not really uh, have that possibility built in. Um, another problem uh, is that um, um, that uh, classifications or uh, descriptions using different criteria are actually placed on the same hierarchical level. So uh, the classifier has to choose whether to 
a classify or defined by anatomical communication or by underlying cause or by clinical symptoms. So you cannot have all of those. So uh, in this system, uh, uh, you cannot have a patient who has uh, an obstructive situation, who has symptomatology of normal pressure, heart and, uh, uh, and, and 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 has an underlying uh, defined uh, uh, event or cause uh, behind it. You cannot have all, but most patients have several of these things. So uh, actually the problem that this uh, system creates for logical classification is that any of these groupings uh, does not exclude uh, one of the other. Having NPH systems do not exclude having uh, an obstructive uh, situation, uh, for instance. Um, uh, so in the real world, any patient is defined by a combination of characteristics and not by a selecting just one. Uh, so the direct consequence uh, of uh, the ICD-10 is that uh, more classifications can actually apply to one uh, patient. So it's not, uh, it's, uh, it is not uh, logical uh, in, in that sense of the word. Um, so um, the, the system inherently uh, has a problem of uh, overlapping uh, diagnosis, being able to apply several uh, diagnostic uh, codings to one patient. Uh, the other um, side of it is actually you can have two different patients uh, who are entirely different in their clinical presentation and in their age, and they can achieve the same diagnosis. Uh, uh, so, um, so the system does not really help to guide us uh, clinically. Uh, the reason why is that this is an or system. You have to choose between this or that or the other and not recognizing that the patient can have several of these things. Uh, the result of this is that the ICD-10 and also the ICD-11 is unhelpful for guiding of, uh, guidance of clinical management. It's not systematic for research and uh, it makes us use or apply unspecific, unspecific codes in daily practice. So many of you will probably find that you use one of the codes that are here at the bottom, other types of hydrocephalus or unspecified hydrocephalus. And that doesn't have anybody, not even the hospital administrator. A brief overview of some other classification proposals. Uh, some of the most important contributions in the literature are listed here. Uh, uh, over the years, um, and uh, you can recognize uh, several of the names here, amongst others, Hal Rikade, of course. Um, the problem here is that you can do, you can divide those in uh, in uh, in systems or proposals that classify by etiology and time of onset, or systems that classify by documented or probable pathology. So again, this is an OR system. I mean, is it more important to classify by etiology or and time of onset, or is it more important to classify by documented or probable pathology? Well, the patient certainly doesn't make a choice because the patient both has etiology, time of onset, and uh, an underlying pathophysiology. So maybe the answer to this is that it's not OR, it's AND. You, you have to consider uh, several of the aspects when you, when you classify and when you uh, uh, make a, um, a description of a hydrocephalic uh, condition. And this is where the proposed aspect system comes in. Instead of having a hierarchy where you have to choose between, between various incongruent uh, sizes at a, at a certain uh, stage of the hierarchy, here we have a parallel system. The reason why it's called aspect is that it's built on a, on a, on a number of, um, of, of factors um, and these factors create the acronym aspect. So every patient has an age, Every patient has some symptoms. Every patient has a history of previous treatment, minding that no previous treatment is also part of the medical history. 
every patient has an underlying etiology, whether we can find it or not, there is a reason behind it. Every patient has a history of complications or no complications could also be part of the history. And every patient has a time of onset. In every patient, it is also feasible and recommended to look for an obstructive site, just as Hal just said. So applying this AND system, it's, it seems to be possible to create a system that is clinically relevant, that is made for clinical guidance, that is easy to use for as a standardized systematic clinical approach, uh, also for research probably, all characteristics apply to any patient. There is no hierarchy of the characteristics, meaning that you can fill in the available information that you have and you're not stuck because you couldn't fill in a level above. So this is the backbone of the system that the group has been working on. So how does it actually work? Well, this is a sort of a, like a pocket card version, uh, one of the ways that it could look. So uh, the first tier is that you identify that there is a hydrocephalic state. Then you apply a core diagnosis, that's called core aspect. Then you characterize by the aspect factors. Uh, and then uh, you look uh, for uh, uh, definition or documentation of a possible uh, of, a, of a potential point of obstruction that you may be able to remedy uh, 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 without putting in uh, shunt hardware. So this is how the system works. Um, looking for the core diagnosis, uh, this diagnosis actually tells you which uh, which age group, age group or which stage of the hydrocephalic history. Uh, you belong to. Ahmed showed uh, for the uh, first of his uh, pictures uh, of his slides in the presentation, the transgression from fetal over infantile via pediatric, via adult to senior hydrocephalus. And patients who grow up with a fetal hydrocephalus do go on through this transgression. So for the core diagnosis, you have either a fetal hydrocephalus or you have a pediatric hydrocephalus, which was congenital, so it was there from the start, or it is acquired pediatric hydrocephalus. If you grow up with one of these, then you are a patient with a transitional hydrocephalus. It can either be a transitional hydrocephalus for somebody who had a pediatric uh, or infantile or uh, fetal uh, type of hydrocephalus who's grown up to be an adult. So that is a documented congenital hydrocephalus proceeding into adult life. It can be a, a, a transition of an acquired pediatric hydrocephalus growing up to an adult, or it can be an adult with a pediatric type of hydrocephalus who is not diagnosed before this person becomes adult. One of the most well-known uh, uh, examples of this is the, the LOVA type of hydrocephalus, which was first described by uh, Professor Oi from, uh, from Japan. The next type of, uh, or the final type of uh, core diagnosis is uh, uh, a true adult type of hydrocephalus, which uh, uh, is diagnosed and uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, is initiated in adulthood. It can either be secondary uh, to uh, various types of causes, trauma, trauma uh, a vascular event, uh, 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 secondary to tumor, actually anything. Or it can be idiopathic uh, and uh, the most well-known uh, type of, uh, of, 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 of that is of course um, uh, the um, the INPH, but uh, uh, actually you could have other types of idiopathic hydrocephalus that isn't uh, NPH. So uh, these are the these are the core diagnoses that uh, that that tells you which stage of hydrocephalus uh, transgression or which type of uh, uh, diagnostic time this patient is presently at. The aspect factors could fit in a little pocket card like this, 
uh, with the anatomy, uh, uh, several options for the anatomy, uh, option for symptomatology, options for previous treatment, options for etiological factors, options for complications to previous treatment, and options to uh, the time of onset. I'll leave this uh, just for a couple of seconds for people to read it. Uh, we've chosen some uh, simple options, uh, not too many for each of those. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and as we go along developing uh, the system, these may become better or more specific, but at least uh, this is the uh, backbone of, of, uh, of the system. Then when you apply the aspect factors, you can go on to an assessment of obstruction probability, which can be either definite, if you can actually see an obstructive membrane, uh, an obstructed aqueduct, uh, an, obstructed, uh, an obstructed fourth ventricle and so forth. You can uh, pass on to uh, likely, uh, doc likely point of obstruction if you have parts of the uh, ventricular system being dilated and other parts of the ventricular system being non-dilated. The uh, point of obstruction must be between the dilated parts and the non-dilated parts, which is also uh, what Hal was presenting so elegantly. You have a possible point of obstruction if the uh, ventricular system looks uh, distended, there is a, uh, there is a bulging corpus callosum, uh, the, the floors and uh, uh, lamina terminalis of the third ventricle, uh, ventricle are bulging, but you cannot actually see or, or infer where actually the point of obstruction is. So this is a possible uh, site of obstruction. And then in the end, uh, uh, if you can identify none of these, the point of obstruction is unlikely to be in the classical anatomical way. Um, but of course there is a, um, an impediment to CSF uh, transgression through the system, but it's, uh, it's, it's at a substructural level in, in these cases. Uh, so the question is whether we are actually approaching uh, a um, type of solution which is simple and useful for a complex um, problem. I am uh, grateful to Joachim for suggesting this uh, symb symbolism uh, as Alexander the Great uh, was shown a very complicated knot that had tied up uh, a uh, war carrier to, uh, to a pole and was instructed to, uh, uh, to, to try to solve or undo this knot. He simply took out his sword and cut through it. Uh, so the question is whether we have uh, cut through some of the uh, complicated issues in, uh, in defining hydrocephalus, which may lead on later to a classification, but, but at least for now is presented as a useful system for defining hydrocephalus in daily clinical work. Um, I think we'll go on to uh, the next presentation, which is, um, is intended to uh, demonstrate uh, some of the ways to use the system in, uh, in practical uh, daily cl clinical work. And I think, uh, you know, I, I, I think that in, uh, questions could probably uh, better be asked uh, or answered after we've seen the next presentation. Thank you very much. Great, Marianne. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne, for brilliant uh, presentation of the new system for classification uh, aspect. Uh, so this is now we come to how to apply it. And actually uh, we are uh, grateful to um, a very, very nice, very skillful, very intelligent young lady, uh, Andrea Pereira, who took, and she is also very brave she took the, the chance or the courage to be the first one to apply this system in her cases in the world, in the in true life. Now, Andrea, show us how did you apply the system? 
And then we will discuss after that what, how easy, how beneficial, and so. Andrea, go ahead. Thank you, Professor Emma. Um, I'm just going to share my slides now. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to discuss and my experience with the aspect classification. I was I felt very privileged to get the opportunity to review it, apply it. Um, I'm a fourth year neurosurgical trainee working at Brighton in the United Kingdom, and I'm in my first registrar year. Um, and I wanted to give a perspective from a, a junior clinician's point of view as to how easy the aspect was to apply and my experience of it. Um, so as um, Professor Judah described, we've got the core diagnosis and I'll be focusing largely on the aspect system, looking at the anatomy, symptomatology, previous management, etiological factors and complications of any previous treatment and the time of onset in cases um, that were sent to us and also cases from our own units and how this was applied. It was really fantastic just to see the group um, the working and the hard work and great sort of scientific methodology that was involved in this um, and I've got six cases to present. So the first case is a one day old um, baby girl who was born at 31 gestational weeks so premature and re referred originally with intraventricular hemorrhage um, with the CT scans as shown there. Um, the head circumference was large and she had a tense and bulging anterior fontanelle um, and she had an EVD for two weeks, which was removed and weaned successfully. A month later, she shows no signs of um, ventricular megaly or hydrocephalus. She's doing well. And the head circumference 36.5, which makes her fit between the 50th and 75th centile for her age, um, corrected for the gestational weeks. Um, and she had a soft, an, soft anterior font fontanelle. Um, so I applied the aspect classification and for anatomy, I gave her, um, she has bilateral ventricular megaly, um, so it's, it's two. Um, for her symptomatology at the time of review, she is asymptomatic. She's had an EVD inserted previously, um, just to note which would be um, in the system would be different from a shunting procedure. And the etiology was vascular, so ventricular hemorrhage. There were no complications to her EVD insertion. And the time of onset was postnatal prior to fontanelle closure. The core diagnosis in this case would be acquired paediatric hydrocephalus. So case two, um, actually for me, was the most uh, complex of them all. And I feel like if a system can encompass this case, then it it's doing pretty well. So um, a full-term baby boy was diagnosed with aqueductal stenosis at birth and had a VP shunt within a couple of days of birth. Um, unfortunately showed signs of infection within two weeks, so it was removed. Um, and then was managed with an EVD, which was unfortunately unable to be weaned after multiple trials. He was referred um, to a specialist unit with an EVD in situ, was lethargic, was showing delayed development with an enlarged head circumference but um, open and lax fontanelle. And he was referred at four months um, following all of this happening. His CT shows loculated ventricles, um, ventricular megaly, and uh, what I think we'd all agree was an atypical appearance as a result of his um, multiple interventions and complications. He has acute symptoms of hydrocephalus and he had multiple modes of management, so a previous shunt um, and multiple EVDs, and it was following a, a genetic abnormality and infection, so I've called him multiple for that. Um, his, he was complicated by an infection, and for his time of onset, the original event which resulted in his presentation was aqueductal stenosis, so for me he would come under the intrauterine um, category. His core diagnosis would be congenital paediatric hydrocephalus because aqueductal stenosis is the underlying pathology in this case. Um, and so that would be the, the ultimate core diagnosis. Case three is a 59 year old lady who was diagnosed with hydrocephalus at birth with um, dysphrosism in childhood. 
And interestingly, she was managed with a lumbar peritoneal shunt shortly after birth, but she presented over 40 years later with evidence of incontinence, memory disturbance, and was found to have an aqueductal stenosis on her MRI. Interestingly enough, on x-rays of her abdomen and spine, there was no evidence of a shunt in situ. So it appears to have been removed at some point. The reasons why were not evident in the notes when she presented to us. Ultimately, she underwent an EVD and that was very successful, alleviating her symptoms. So I'm going to apply the aspect system from the perspective of her presentation to us prior to her treatment with the ETV. So in terms of anatomy, she's got triventricular megaly um, and she's presenting with chronic symptoms with Hakeem's triad. She's had a previous LP shunt, which is documented, although it's been removed. Um, and her etiology would be developmental genetic abnormality. abnormality. Um, she's not got any complications as far as we're aware, but we, we don't know why the shunt was removed. So I've gone with the information avail available and put none for that. And the time of onset is intrauterine. In terms of her core diagnosis, she would be transitional hydrocephalus type A because she's got a documented childhood hydrocephalus presentation. Um, so for the last, um, the next case, um, we'll give some time just to allow um, the viewers perhaps to try and work through the aspect classification. Um, so this was a 63 year old lady who presented originally 14 years ago, presenting with mild headache and some forgetfulness, but has got an MRI that was reported as normal, not showing any ventricular megaly. Unfortunately, we don't have the images. 16 years later, she presents with unsteady gait, urinary continence and dementia. Um, so diagnosis is a suspect diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus. Her anatomy, um, she would have all in dilated subarachnoid spaces. Her symptoms would be a chronic presentation with Hakim's triad. She's not had any previous management, no um, known etiological factors and no complications as she's not had any intervention. And her onset time would be adult. Um, her core diagnosis in this situation would be that of idiopathic hydrocephalus. Um, so case five was a very interesting case that presented to our unit. So it's a 39 year old lady who presented with a month's history of urinary incontinence, gait disturbance and memory difficulties. And she was GCS 15 on arrival. Um, she had some worsening headache um, and she underwent an ETV and biopsy. So in terms of the aspect, I've applied the aspect system as of her presentation prior to her management with an ETV. Um, so I'll give everyone a few moments to perhaps see what your thoughts are um, before I share mine. Okay. Um, so in terms of her anatomy, um, we have her tri I thought she had triventricular megaly, um, presenting with relatively acute symptoms. She's not had any previous management um, prior to her presentation, and the etiology would be um, caused by a neoplasm. She had no complications. Um, and her time of onset would be adult, and her core diagnosis would be adult secondary hydrocephalus. And in this case, her biopsy of the relevant area went on to show pineocytoma, um, and she's under close observation. The next case is a 47 year old gentleman who's otherwise fit and well, um, and is presenting CT as shown here. So he presents in coma, intubated and ventilated and sedated and um, went to theatre for an EVD. He then went on to have a CTA and a DSA, which showed um, a dual AV fistula um, surrounding the forum and magnum and went to have that surgically treated. But his EVD was weaned over the course of two weeks. 
um, prior to his definitive surgical management. He's approximately four months post-op at the time of his scan at recent follow-up, and it does show some ventricular megaly for which he is completely asymptomatic, so he has no cognitive difficulties, is functioning normally at home. Um, so again, I'll give the viewers some time to see what their thoughts were. Um, so in terms of his anatomy, um, I thought we had triventricular megaly. He was asymptomatic. He was previously managed with an EVD, um, which was removed. And his, the cause was a vascular cause. There were no complications to his EVD insertion um, and his time of answer was adults. And his core diagnosis was that of adult secondary hydrocephalus. So for me, I um, just wanted to talk about a bit about my experience with the aspect system. So in terms of the main benefit has really been acting as an aid memoir. And I was discussing with the team, I've really noticed a difference and been applying this on call has helped me greatly just scan through referrals in terms of complex hydrocephalus patients. The system, I think, highlights factors which would come very subconsciously to a very experienced clinician but may not be as obvious to someone starting out like myself and using the system to systematically go through referrals when seeing patients in clinic um, has really helped me in gather information quickly. Um, I can visualize this in clinic letters and a great tool for communication um, with other clinicians allowing people to get a very quick and clear view of the patient. I found it very applicable even to very complex cases of hydrocephalus, um, for example, case two, and I think is very, very inclusive of all types of patients with hydrocephalus, as much as one can be. Once I was familiar with the system, it was very quick to apply and the acronym makes it very easy to remember. And I find it very easy to use from a trainee perspective. So I think um, give you an idea of how your registrars and juniors would be applying it. The aspect system will evolve throughout the patient's journey, which is uh, great because the patient's clinical condition is changing so frequently, although it perhaps will raise some issues in terms of its application in research with, the, with it constantly fluctuating, but I think gives a really great picture. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone for letting me be involved. Um, and that that's all my that's my talk. Thank you, Andrea. It's brilliant. You really have presented a very good presentation and showed in this we call it pilot study, how aspect system can be used and applied successfully in different varieties of hydrocephalus and how this is really can keep a good record for the patient and easy for communication. Now we will go to the last part of our webinar, the panel discussion. We would like very much to invite uh, Marianne and Harold, Rike, Andrea and Jacom and, uh, and uh, Andrea as well. And, um, and of course, uh, Harold Rike and all of you that's been in the discussion. It's, that is, uh, we received a few questions and please, you know, for the audience, if you have any question, please write it in Q and A mm -hmm. and we will try to follow your questions and present them. I have the, I, a question I would like to present it to all the panelists, um, how do you think realistically this system is going to improve the outcome of the management of hydrocephalus? Wow. So we start with, yes, Andre. Oh, Ahmed, a system that um, will improve the outcome, that's, that's very, um, high level request to be honest. Um, I, I mean, we are this. This is a basic uh, system. Um, it, it, it is about 
understanding the diversity of the problem of hydrocephalus, because we all know, and everyone in neurosurgery has experienced that, that simply it is the neonate with an hemorrhage and then developing hydrocephalus is different from a senior adult with a neural pressure hydrocephalus. So um, I, I don't believe there will be any system or classification that, that will influence outcome. I mean, what we want to achieve is that you can more easily compare the different aspects of a disease because the diversity of hydrocephalus is so, so great that you want to bring this back into um, the basic aspects. And that is where we had this acronym um, um, on, on, on some topics that are, I would say, always there with, in any patient with the diagnosis hydrocephalus. And from there you can build on. Uh, and we also know that, um, that, and that is the good part of this system is that in the course of a whole disease, and we know patients, um, if you have, um, Marianne was telling this, pediatric patients grow up to be at adults and still are hydrocephalic patients because hydrocephalus is not solved. It's not cured. Uh, you still, it is chronic disease. So it is, and, and then you will see in applying this system that we have just presented now so beautifully by Marianne and also by Andrea in showing these different cases that by changing this as a clinician, I mean, it is a clinical, clinical kind of system that you, that you apply in daily practice. And then you will see how this will change over time. And then it will tell you only by seeing the different aspects over the time, have there been a lot of complications, have there been, uh, so the different situation, you will see how this has developed over time. So this is not a static classification. I think that, that, is, that, well, that is exactly, that's exactly the point, Andrea, that is, this is not a static classification. No. That's the dynamic classification. Exactly. It may influence, that's yeah. the point, that it may influence the decision-making. And once you have the right decision for the right patient, you will have a better outcome. Of that's course. what I meant. At the end, we will uh, want to have to achieve that. Yeah. Do you want to have any comment, uh, Marianne? Or yes, have? Uh, um, one of the things we were discussing uh, along the way uh, was whether this was actually a classification system or whether this was a checklist. Uh, and in the end, I uh, personally think that it may not make all that difference whether you call it one or the other. But one of the advantages of the, of the system could actually be exactly what Andrea said, that this acronym forces you to go through all the aspects of this patient's hydrocephalus. And when you take all aspects into account, then you probably make better clinical decisions. If you know what kind of complications the patient had before, if you know whether the patient did not or, did, or had a, an attempt at an ETV before, uh, if you know that this patient uh, 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 has a pediatric type of hydrocephalus and not, a, not a, a primary adult type of hydrocephalus, I think in the end, this makes you make better clinical decisions on a more comprehensive level. So indirectly, I think that we will achieve better management for the patient simply because we're forced to take all the factors into account. Very good. Actually, that is Hal, uh, during our discussion, he mentioned um, Checklist Manifesto book. And actually, I remember that very well. And he actually, one of the people who said, this is, looks like checklist and which is very important. That is when we check all the minute changing will come. What do you like to comment, Hal? You know, I, I, I'm still processing a lot of this and, and, and growing a little bit as I'm doing that. I, um, the problem, the thing that's most exciting to me 
is that really what you're doing is you're creating um, a modified history of the patient and, and the physiology and all of these things. You know, I think that the fact, the problem, the biggest problem now that we face in, in hydrocephalus, especially from pediatric neurosurgeons, is the transition from pediatrics to adult, to adult neurosurgery and how horrible that is for the patient. I would like to see um, a voluntary use of the cloud um, and, the, and the aspect system, and that each time a patient sees someone, the it, it, voluntarily, the the physician or the nurse practitioner or whoever it is that sees them can access the cloud, and ask. And no matter where you are in the world, you can you can know about what's happened to this person already. As somebody who really, I think, for the last ten or fifteen years of my career, I was a transition neurosurgeon. I was I was taking care of all of these these young adults who were were abandoned by their pediatric neurosurgeons. And, um, and so the, my job was to try to re redo what they had had for the, the earlier 20, 20 years. I think that if we use the, as the, uh, uh, the aspect kind the approach to this, that would always be able to uh, follow the, the patient for the rest of his or her life. And I think that's really exciting. And I think that's one of the biggest, biggest challenges. And so I, I um, you know, I think maybe that I'm really horrified when I see a patient who's had, I've, you know, sometimes 50 operations before they got to me, and each one in a different hospital someplace else. And how how in the world can I figure out what's 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 going on? And I think that if we see this maintained, um, you, you would always want to tell the families to keep this 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 information with them, and they never do. They absolutely never do. It's too much. They real, real, the real world is too difficult for them to, to maintain a, a whole box of medical records. And they always think that you want to see what their lab works were and all of those things, rather than what you really need was to see what the scan said and what the operative note was. So I think one of the, I think for, for science and all of that, it has real potential. The real, the real major thing to me is the, how to follow the patient over the lifetime of a patient. I showed you a, a patient I had taken care of for 20, over 20 years. Um, there are not a lot of people who've seen the same patient for 20 years. Mm. So I, I keep going, let's keep going. Yes. It's, it's, thank you very much. Really, that is the use uh, information technology and the IT would be really uh, possible with this pro uh, system and maybe add a lot to it. Now we ask the, the young people who are really, they will have to apply this. Uh, Jacob, uh, you did a great work. Thank you very much again and thanks to your colleagues. We really appreciate and recognize all what you did. In applying the system in the real life, what do you think is the difficulties you may face? There are there will be some difficulties first in distributing the system. Um, I, think, I think the system is not perfect as it is uh, right now, and it probably never will be. Um, but um, but it, it requires a lot of real world, real world experience uh, to perfect it. Um, so I, I'm really, I'm really uh, glad that we can use this ENS uh, platform to, to distribute the system, so we can hopefully get a lot of uh, a lot of good uh, feedback on how the system works in in real life. The the experiences that uh, Andrea has provided and, and some of the experiences we've gotten from our own clinic ha has have been really valuable in the, in optimizing the system. So. Uh, Andrea, thank you for your really applying uh, the system and use it. I would like also to ask the same question for you. In real life, when you applied the system in different cases, what was the most difficult thing you faced or you had to face? Well, sometimes there's a degree of uncertainty, but I like the descriptive 
aspect so it allows you to comment on that uncertainty in parts and I guess where the information isn't fully available often we have a suspicion um th there will of course be I guess cases that don't fit neatly within that and I guess that will come with experience of the classification and it does it does take a little bit of guessing used to but not very long at all I would say by the third case of applying it um it's very it's very easy and straightforward straightforward to use um but yeah of course there will be cases where there's either a degree of uncertainty maybe a degree of overlap um but it, there's definitely room to include that in your documentation given the sort of descriptive nature so that really helps uh, andrea you wanted to say something oh and uh, well um just to um um to clarify that this is not um, a one-time system to be applied. It is the basic. So at one point, and this will not be of uh, great use immediately, but if you apply this and in, for any patient you see with hydrocephalus, you would already help the concern that um, Harold was, uh, was talking about after some time that you don't know how disease has had developed and what was in the beginning of the problem. So why did they have 50 uh, surgeries for their hydrocephalus? Um, from this system, you can already know when it started, what kind of hydrocephalus it was, fetal, neonatal, transitional, adult type, and what happened over times. So this is, the, it is applied at the moment you as a clinician sees the patient for the first time. And that is not always the first instance of the disease. Sometimes you see a patient that already had this, but gradually we can start to compare a whole group of patients based upon a few, very few clinically relevant issues on this. And then you can start to compare. And then you will see that you, um, uh, well, which groups will have more complications, will, which groups from, um, from time of onset on will have. So therefore it is a dynamic, a dynamic system. And I think this is what, uh, therefore, it is difficult to say classification, although classification is just, um, it's a kind of qualitative um, classification, not quantitative, but qualitative. It is, you, you, you define the attributes, attributes to, of, of the disease, hydrocephalus, the different parts of the disease to that patient. And that is reflected in this system, the aspect that you have. So uh, very important to say this is not a score. You cannot calculate anything out of it. But if you have these um, um, well, well, six items, you will already know basics of the start and the development of this condition, hydrocephalus in that individual patient. And that's a start. And we didn't never had that before in classifying based upon old classifications called obstructive communica communicating, or it's always obstructive and extra and intraventricular, or name it. That aspect of the disease had never been um, um, used into a kind of system for an individual patient. And that is what this makes it attractive for me. But I also would suggest, Ahmed, that we look into the questions and answers, but because I looked into it, there are some very interesting questions. And I realized that now uh, we have this webinar also get to get input from other people. Uh, we have still uh, nearly 150 participants and at the top, we had nearly 200 that are really um, um, showing that hydrocephalus is a disease that everyone in daily practice 
will be confronted with. So it is but, so common. Therefore, please. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> right. We really have a lot of questions, and uh, uh, from. Uh, Dr. Orlan, uh, okay, now he really wrote a very important question, and was not only that, he said he is ready to start use the aspect from now on. We have also another question. I, I really all the questions are important. I don't I don't know how to choose between them. <laughs> and, but the first question was asked from a colleague uh, uh, asked about what do we mean by the onset onset. Um, uh, of uh, the time of onset. So if Yakom uh, or Marianne can answer that. I think Joachim had already um, given you a mention it. Say it open and Joachim did it well. Yeah, so the intention with the time of onset is the, the time where the pathological uh, process starts. Um, of course, we don't always know that. Uh, often, we probably don't know that actually. So, really, the the way to approach these factors is by 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 giving your best estimate, uh, judging from the symptomatology and judging from the radiology. Uh, well, actually, we have a lot of uh, very good. Uh, uh, question. Maybe you want uh, to find uh, some of the nice questions to answer. Maybe I could make uh, a couple of comments. Yes, please. Uh, so uh, uh, one of the questions I saw at least was uh, uh, how to uh, how to uh, assess uh, inter-observer uh, uh, differences, and of course uh, one of the uh, one of the needed things is to, to validate the system, and, and, and that is where we need uh, probably in the future a lot of input from people who use the system uh, and find out the faults and the, um, and, and, and the things that need to be changed or specified. At least there are a couple of challenges that I see. One of the things was uh, already mentioned by Joachim, that some of the things you may not actually know for definite, and then you have to provide your best estimate. This is nothing, not, uh, not necessarily a fault of the system, but it is, uh, shall we say, uh, one of the problems that we face in, in the real world. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there are some of the, um, some of the uh, uh, items or some of the uh, stages that have, have to be uh, uh, shall we say, specified or uh, qualified uh, uh, in a better way. For instance, it can be difficult to know uh, when a person has a uh, probable or possible uh, pediatric heart encephalus, which is diagnosed in adult life. This is a bit akin to the time of onset. Somebody presents with a clinical picture and with radiology that makes you think that this is very probably or very likely a pediatric onset, but in fact, you don't know. So there are some things that we still need to work on how to specify and clarify so that people could use it in the same standardized way. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll uh, go to question just and comments. Uh, first one in front of me from Raisin uh, Mac Nucleus. He asked about, do you plan to make any recommendation to WHO ICD, and uh, I think that is we will wait to see how successful we are before we're going on. But thank you for at least appreciating our uh, effort, and we would like really to keep in contact. There are also another uh, recommendation, another question uh, about. Um, Is it uh, from Ilian Sivileva? Is it difficult to diagnose the disease at an earlier stage? Can I first diagnose it by myself? Yes. I, I, yes, Andrea, if you want to answer. I think yes, that's that's part of it, because the um, the, the system has to be applied by the one who sees the patient first. And if you are the one who, who shows that, and maybe even the next morning in a round, the staff will, uh, will, will change it and say, 
well, listen, this is this was not neonatal onset or this was not this. So you it's flexible. It's uh, but initially it is like Andrea very nicely showed in the different cases, something that you have to apply yourself as the person who sees the patient with a hydrocephalus and an acute problem. Because when you see the patient, the patient is admitted, not because it, it, they are going well, usually because there is a problem. So you diagnose it. And at that moment, you can apply that. And over time, it can change, of course. So this is the flexibility. And that's the, maybe the different from classical classifications of um, just giving one item to them and say, this is anatomical, uh, this is this, or uh, from its only age, it is, it, it's a dynamic thing to do. Okay, I, also, I also like the question just in, uh, in front of that from Frederick Wannis, who say, are you already, um, would you already modify or change your approach for the, to the therapy of hydrocephalus based on this system? I think, personally, I think that's already too early to say that based upon what we see now and classify, we just have to see how this develops. Um, decisions are still made on an individual basis, at least for me. Well, we hope that if this is will help in making the right decision okay. for the right patient at the right time. Well, I have another question in front of me from uh, Dr. Okan Rodi again. He's asking about a very important issue, which actually we discussed between us several times. Did you consider ICB measurement as a component as a component to the system, and what sorts and the con condition did you come to? Or conclusion, what sort and conclusion did you come to? So is this Marianne or Hal? Well, I'll try and, and, and start and then uh, maybe Hal can take over. Uh, the same question has also been put by Sophia Shostika from Cambridge and probably by several others. Uh, and of course, we have, uh, we've, uh, we've thought about that. It's not uh, at this point in time part of the system, but the, as we said, the the system is uh, not finished. Um, it's a parallel system, uh, which means that you don't break up a hierarchy or you don't break up a systematic pro progression of diagnostics by introducing other factors. So it can be, uh, it can be included. Uh, we just don't know exactly how to include it yet. And may I maybe add to that? that ICP measurement is more or less already an intervention that you do. So to apply a system cannot include an invasive intervention by a doctor. At the end, when you, when you decide or when you have thought about uh, where the problem is, it's not the kind of diagnosis that we do with it. The diagnosis is clear, but we, we try to um, classify or give a systematic order to the different types of hydrocephalic diseases that we, that we encounter. You can't add into that immediately at the first moment. So the moment, for example, as Andrea, as a resident, was seeing those patients and applying the system, she cannot apply ICP measurement because that would need already an intervention. And an intervention is something that you do to it. And actually the intervention, the measurement, is, will change the aspect score that you have at that moment afterwards, because then you have additional knowledge. You know more. But you have to do it based upon clinical diagnosis and imaging, because for all the classifications, that is usually what we have. And that's the first thing. And from there on, you go further. And therefore, I think in such a basic systematic ordering of 
different types of hydrocephalus, we cannot add a measurement of something that needs a search or a, a, a medical intervention. Yeah, but that's my opinion. Would you like to add something, Hal? You are muted, Hal. Hello, Harold. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah I, I, um, I, I was going to say sort of the same thing that, that you did. Um, when, we, when we learned about the aspect thing, it was made clear that we wanted to, somebody in, in an emergency room or a, 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 somebody who's seeing the patients uh, in an urgent situation who has the original scan should be able to do an aspect uh, analysis um, at, that, at, that, at that point. So even getting a high level flow study on an MRI scan is, is not necessary for the, for the aspect coding. And therefore it's available to the first practitioner that sees the patient. So I think that it's that's one of the reasons not to put ICP monitoring or demand for specific f uh, types of MRI scan, um, so that it can be useful uh, in the um, in the in the in the first the first uh, assist, uh, uh, in, encounter, rather than uh, waiting for another piece of study. I, and I think that what I hear is that that the vast majority of uh, neurosurgeons in the United States even refuse to consider tapping the, a, a reservoir to measure, for, to measure the pressure. So um, the, uh, ICP is rarely part, it, it, although it's assumed, it's, very, it's rarely part of the knowledge base that le leads to your making decisions. There is another question, which actually also was discussed between our group before, but it is important to put it in public and everyone to see. This is from our colleague, Nerpreri Gizigoro. He say, if this is not a score, why do we give numbers to each condition and not just to make a tick? I think that's a very good question, and we've discussed it, as you said, uh, 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 along the way. Uh, uh, and 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 uh, I think um, uh, one of the previous questions was whether we uh, were thinking of approaching uh, WHO or the uh, or other organizations uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, classification and coding of diseases. And I think the way to uh, shall we say, sum up the aspect uh, uh, in, 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 in a combination of numbers and letters is inspired by that kind of coding. Uh, so it, 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 it behind it is that kind of usefulness. Um, uh, we could have used uh, another type of combination of codings uh, uh, of letters and numbers, uh, and this is simply what we choose. In my mind, actually, there are two ways to use the system. Uh, and one way is to use uh, coding uh, uh, with a combination of letters and numbers. And the other one is the more narrative type uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of description for each uh, of the aspect factors, uh, not, of course, in, uh, in, 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 in a full uh, text, but, but by using the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, ab abbreviated uh, ways of describing, which is already provided in the aspect, when you say none or when you say the patient has had uh, infection and bleeding as complications, as a slightly, shall we say, extended description, just as you may extend uh, other classifications uh, like GCS by providing. Uh, uh, a little more detail behind the coding. So you can use it both ways, I think. And I, I, I think it is very important to stress the fact that this never have, has been developed as a kind of hydrocephalus severity score. So it's nothing to calculate numbers together and then say, oh, this is a number. So this is a very severe hydrocephalus. This has never been the 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 the, the the reason to, to think about this. It is a, um, there are some basic aspects of the disease that are described, easily recognized by, even by the numbers. Um, and it is 
developing over the, the term of the whole years that the patient has this higher disease. And at one point, if you apply this and get used to it, what you can see in the different scores over time is very quickly based on, for example, the development of the C, if you see that over the times, you see seven aspects score, scores of a patient that is sent to you, and you see how the C has gone up from zero to four and so on. You know, this was a complicated um, course of the hydrocephalus. By the way, if it was always zero, you know, this was not a complicated course. So quickly, by very soon, if you see that, but it is you that is of course getting used to it, you will have just by seeing that already have the initial idea of what you are dealing with. And maybe even in severity, but also this is this is showing it on, on, on these six aspects of the disease. He said, that's all, not more, but also not less than that. Thank you very much, Andre. Actually, there are several questions asking about, uh, you solved the confusion. Many people ask it about the score system and uh, you answered it. I think that is, we have a lot of questions and I maybe I will end with the coming question and then because we are over time actually, but uh, I, I, I will, uh, Ask Anna from the uh, EANS if we can get all the questions and in one way or another to answer them, either email or put it in our uh, website or something like that. The very last question before I uh, handle um, um, uh, the floor to Mansoor for closing remarks and for the statement. There is from um, uh, 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 a colleague, I, I missed her, but I remember the questions. She asked, how can you know that it's explain this system or rely this system to the patient and the family? Seems that she thinks it's complicated, but how can we make it easy for the family and for the patient to understand it? Maybe Jacob, if you would like to say. Well, as I, as I just uh, got around to answer in the Q&A section, I think uh, it is like it is complicated, the whole system in its totality. And uh, just listing all the numbers, of course, uh, for individual patients won't help them at all. But I think all the individual and entities of, uh, of the system are somewhat simple and, sh and should be explainable to uh, to patients, at least patients that are not mentally impaired in, in any way. And I, I think it's an interesting and very, and very important point to, to raise because patient education is really, really important in, uh, in making the best um, choices for, for patients, of course. Thank you very much. And really, it was a great uh, webinar. Now, Mansoor, take over. Um, Ahmad, the whole panel, marvelous. Um, if I may just share a screen, uh, I've just prepared some slides in the last five minutes just to summarize what, what, what we've heard, if that's acceptable with the panel and with the participants. Um, and I hope you can see this. Um, I think to, to, for me, it's very humbling once again, to see so much work being done so rapidly in such a short space of time. And one of these main reasons is, of course, Marianne and Joachim and, and Kasper, who brought a lot of this work from Copenhagen as a good foundation for us to build on. And um, we can't thank them enough. And I think this is wonderful. The other is that this has been done with very unified effort by good colleagues, young minds, as well as uh, more wiser minds. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> and uh, with, with great experience. And it's a wonderful classification. Someone didn't point out in the questions, a very valid question, that the name aspect as a classification is already in use, or certainly as a checklist, perhaps, or more. 
um, and, and it, <clears throat> it's the Alberta uh, scoring system for CT scan, which, which we're aware of. I don't see that personally as a, as a hindrance, and we'll discuss that, but this is a great start. Um, some thoughts again to share with you is that to revise what we've already said, or the panel have reiterated that so far, this is a system which is not intended at the moment to be a score or measure magnitude, as we have said right from the beginning. And it's there to facilitate communication and record keeping, to save lives and improve quality of life. We can't under, uh, uh, under you know, say this enough in the sense that one of the reasons, or perhaps the main reason, why the task force and why we allocated such weight to this <coughs> is that hydrocephalus is a benign condition. So much emphasis is put on, on treatment and neurosurgery of conditions which are, are not benign, uh, which we are very grateful for. Mm -hmm. But how important it is to get this right is cannot be understated. So for education and training and research and to make progress, please do join us on the 23rd of February, which is a recurring meeting. And also we will see you in Hamburg. Some other additional points. I loved, we all loved Harold's presentation who showed the challenges with, with, uh, with the shunt from hell and, and, and the problems. And in addition, when we re remember that six shunts per year on average for 100,000 population in the Western industrialized world with 30 to 40% revision rate in the first year is a reason why we need to clarify the definition and a system and a better classification. Also, we mustn't forget the head injury and hemorrhage and NPH, which is increasing in prevalence in the adult population. And this is a huge work. And this makes it by far the most common operation done, I think, in neurosurgery. Uh, and we, I may be wrong in that, but this is, you know, in, in our department, well over 100 shunts are done per year. Uh, and as far as the same operation, if you like, or, or, or the same family operations, this is quite extraordinary. We need clear documentation and to aid in patient passport provision, which has been discussed today. And we invite others to make progress on this work. And we reach out to the pediatric, adult, and all organizations related to Hydrocaf and CSF, whether it's WFNS, national groups, and all other groups. I, I know we are massive number of brothers and sisters in China, in India, in South America, and others that are perhaps keen to collaborate. We will work with them. And, and coming to the closing stages, I think the checklist versus classification is a very valid point. Whether it's checklist or classification, to be frank, I, whatever you call it, as long as it provides the benefits, it's fine. But eventually for research, we would need to qualified for a classification. And whether we call it aspect versus another name, whether we have aspect for hydrocephalus or uh, uh, to differentiate it from aspect in stroke management, uh, I don't feel that's an, a major issue. We can, we can modify that or work around that. Whether it's qualitative or quantitative, this can evolve. If it's eventually a scoring system that will have increased number of numerical value, it is possible to make this evolve into something that will measure. And we're not suggesting that's the case at the moment. It's certainly qualitative and very useful. But the attraction of the new system to be adopted is because of its simplicity <laughs> uh, and also its intuitive with clear benefits. And as it can evolve increasingly to become more comprehensive with complexity, it will show its benefits. A minor point, uh, which has been discussed or appeared minor, it may be something major for the group that aspect and core is a great building block. Maybe we can expand this to something like aspecty to include ICP or other things. So there's a lot that can be done. And one of the reasons personally, I favor like, like maybe some of the panel to, to include ICP is that measurement of ICP is increasingly becoming non-invasive with the, with the instruments that are going to become available, which are already available in line with shunts. So it's something to, to ponder on as far as expansion of, the, of this, this term. And the team are open for collaboration. And I, I can't stress enough how wonderful it's been to see such good consultation in this united group. Um, and because the power of this group uh, is through the unity and the welfare can only be through consultation. It cannot be through individual uh, 
one person efforts or one group somewhere in the world. Uh, it, it's a collaboration. And we need to success, we need to succeed in this classification collaboration. We need it. The patients need it. And, and thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, team. Thank you very much. And uh, we may see you again in, not, in another webinar in the near future. And hopefully, really, we see each other in Hamburg in October. And please, anyone attended, anyone who wants to join us, write to us. And we, anyone has an idea, we will come any idea. Any group, society would like to join, more than welcome. And we will, not, we will meet again. And thank you very much. It was a wonderful evening, a great start. Thanks again, before we leave, to the young people who helped us a lot, uh, the Danish team, Jakob, Kaspar, and the colleagues, uh, Andrea from UK, and my very good friends, uh, Hal, Marianne, and uh, Andrea, and of course, Vasu, who really made a great job. Thank you very much, and have a great evening. God bless you all. Take care. Okay, all the best for to all of you.